So how consequential is this, knowing it's unclear when, if ever, this is going to trial? So absolutely. There's no trial date set yet. There's not even a hearing been set by Judge Chutkin, who is overseeing the case. But what we're getting here are new details that, that give us a flavor of how Jack Smith would argue the case when it goes to trial, if and when it goes to trial. And some of the most interesting details in this filing have to do with Trump's interactions with former Vice President Mike Pence. And there are a lot of raised eyebrows and even a attacks by Trump's lawyers when Jack Smith, the special counsel, refiled this indictment and left all the interactions with Pence in there. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, the, the Supreme Court had ruled that anything that had to do with Trump's official line of duty was, was not um, allowable in this case. He's, in, he's got immunity for that. So Jack Smith is arguing that actually um, these interactions with Pence were as two running mates on the same ticket, uh, not as official um, you know, president and vice president, and therefore they are allowable if this case goes to trial. A lot of people said the same thing when this hit today. Timing, shades of James Comey, less than five weeks out from an election, this is unsealed. How come? Well, I mean, this is part of the case getting started again after the Supreme Court handed it back to the lower court. Um, there's no, um, you know, there's nothing official that's going to actually be decided mm -hmm. uh, here, and the judge is setting her, her schedule. Um, the, the filing also uh, talks a lot about how Trump's interactions with the state um, election officials. And in that uh, case, Smith is arguing that the president has no official role in uh, how the states certify their elections. So again, all of those conversations uh, amounted to private activities. Can we address the redactions as well? I noticed redactions in some parts that were the name eliminated, but in parentheses, a description of that person's title, like vice president's chief of staff. <laughs> Why is any of this redacted at all, Sarah? Well, that's, in fact, that's a very good question. I mean, the redactions were minimal and, as you said, sort of questionable because it was mm. clear who they're referring to. Hmm. You don't need a decoder ring to figure out who we're I talking about here. Although you certainly need a lot of time to work through it all if you choose to read the whole thing. 165 pages long, that's 80 sure. pages of evidence. Yeah. It's pretty substantive. We have, by the way, heard uh, from the Trump campaign, Yes, uh, the spokesperson for the campaign calling this a witch hunt, um, which you would expect to see, and calling into question the activities of the special counsel, suggesting that he was jumping the gun with an official special counsel report. Will we hear back from Jack Smith on that? Well, it's not likely at this point. Uh, it'll go uh, back to the Trump uh, team, and then the government will be able to have a, a rebuttal before mm -hmm. the end of October. So there will be oh, more so filings uh, all before, before the election. election. Amazing. We'll, of course, be talking to Sarah Forden about it right here. Thank you, Sarah, for being with us as the news breaks today in Washington. This afternoon, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, stopping by Georgia on a visit to tour some of the damaged areas from Hurricane Helene. She and President Biden also uh, on the road today. He was in the Carolinas, the trip including stops across multiple states. And as I just mentioned, Carolinas, Georgia, two important swing states. We're now joined by Bloomberg's Saleya Mosin. Uh, for more on the political optics here against the backdrop of a, of a natural disaster, Saleya, these are very delicate moments, but can be opportunities for a campaign. Uh, they're going to continue travel like this tomorrow, having already seen Donald Trump in Georgia. How are they doing on the tour? You're right. Delicate is the right word for this, Joe, because you don't want neither Kamala Harris or Donald Trump want to look opportunistic. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a former president and the sitting vice president, both who are running for uh, a term, they should be present um, in North Carolina. I mean, this is a, an important region as well. Yeah. Uh, but also bringing a spotlight to the area could a unlock funding for them on the state level, federal level, et cetera, and get people's attention on this. Um, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of um, each candidate trying to go on the offense and kind of own that story. Mm -hmm. Well, we've heard from each of them, respectively, Harris announcing 100 percent federal cost share for Georgia's uh, aid that's needed, while Biden will do the same for uh, North Carolina. Of course, this is not the only thing we heard from Joe Biden about today when he was talking about uh, a natural disaster. He also was warning of man-made disaster today in reference to the ongoing dock worker strike that, of course, began yesterday, telling reporters he'd like to see an agreement as soon as possible. This natural disaster is incredibly consequential. The last thing we need on top of that is a man-made disaster, what's going on at the ports. We're getting pushback already, and we're hearing from the folks regionally 
that they're having trouble getting the product they need because of the port strike. So obviously this is a difficult line for this administration to walk, Saleya. You want to be pro-union. You want to be on the side of collective bargaining and collective bargaining and organized labor. But also, if you're warning about man-made disaster, knowing this could bring severe economic consequences, how long before push, push comes to shove and the administration has to change its tune? Well, Biden has so far said he's not going to intervene, but we could very well hear in a couple of days, in a week, that he's already intervened. He comes out to say, OK, I, I, gave, I made a phone call. This is an interesting moment, though, because Bloomberg just published a story last week that I wrote about how a Harris presidency, a potential Harris presidency, may very likely be more pro-business than Biden was. Biden really vilified business executives, corporations. And this is a moment where, like you're saying, he's walking this very careful line between wanting to uh, vilify, again, the, the companies that are involved in this and raising prices and how it's affecting union workers. But maybe if he'd had better ties to corporations, he had a, a back channel to, to intervene through. As opposed to... Taft Hartley taking extreme action, which he says he will not do. Kamala Harris has found some nuanced areas of sunlight between herself and Joe Biden since she's been at the top of the ticket. How about walk the picket line while the president's working this out? Oh, I mean, you're right. She has found these these little areas to to exploit and, and to kind of cast herself a little bit differently yeah. from the Biden-Harris administration to just the Harris-Walls campaign. Um, I don't know. Let's see if she if she's able to pull that off. Let, we'll see what happens over the mm -hmm. next couple of days. All right. Bloomberg Saleh Mosin, thank you mm -hmm. so much for joining us. Now, President Biden also today joined a call with other G7 leaders to discuss the allies' response to Iran's missile strike against Israel yesterday. He spoke with reporters earlier about those discussions. Obviously, Iran has gone way out of, I mean, it's way off board. We'll be discussing with the Israelis what they're going to do, but they have, all seven of us agree that they have a right to respond, but they should respond in proportion. For more, we're joined now by Bloomberg's Courtney McBride. Courtney, do we have an understanding of what this administration thinks a proportionate response is, knowing Biden was also asked if he supported Israel hitting Iran's nuclear sites, and he said no. Well, we don't have uh, a clear understanding of, of what would be acceptable, but we know that the nuclear sites uh, and potentially some oil and gas infrastructure could precipitate a, another Iranian response and, and trigger uh, another cycle of, of escalating violence, which is exactly what the Biden administration is trying to head off. So it sounds like that might be a bridge too far uh, for the White House and maybe for Israel. Nuclear sites are one thing. Energy infrastructure is off the table then, Courtney? Well, they haven't said that, that it's off the table, but I think the, the key really seems to be from, from the U.S. perspective, calibrating a response that they expect to come militarily from Israel, but making sure that it is the type of response that is itself uh, the end of, of this round of hostilities and that doesn't precipitate a, a, a tit for tat, if you will. Mm hmm well, tit for tat is something we've been hearing a lot about, Courtney. We also know that the U.S. has been preemptively sending more uh, assets and troops to the Middle East. They were involved, of course, defensively uh, yesterday, as we've talked about. Uh, do, do we have an understanding of whether more assets are going to be deployed or if they are keeping positioning on the U.S. part steady for now until they figure out how much tat is titted back? <laughs> Uh, I mean, at this stage, the, the U.S. forces, you know, as you said, played a role in, in the response to the Iranian attack in, in defending and intercepting some of those incoming missiles. But at this stage, um, it, it seems to be status quo. Uh, and really, those U.S. assets are there as a, as a deterrent for, against further Iranian action. So, Courtney, what's the next move for the administration? We've seen 10 visits by Anthony Blinken. We know almost Hochstein has been deeply involved, uh, apparently not very successfully, in preventing this incursion into Lebanon. Is the CIA director still engaged, or are we just waiting, like everyone else, to see what happens next? Well, I mean, the, the continuing message uh, from U.S. officials is that all of those talks are ongoing. You know, you, you referenced CIA Director Bill Burns' efforts to, to secure a, a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of the remaining hostages held by Hamas. Um, all of those efforts 
continue, but obviously they have become uh, a bit more complicated, uh, perhaps a bit more difficult uh, with the events of the last week or so.